You've likely heard of the famous constant pi. You know, 3.14159, and it goes on for quite a while. Well, actually, it goes on forever. But it's common sense that the infinite wonders of pi are not exclusive to pi. I mean, there's a reason why irrationals are a thing. It just so happens to be that pi is the circumference over diameter, the circle constant. But what if I were to say that there's a superior irrational number? A number that occurs in math so much that they nicknamed it the natural number. This is Euler's number, and boy is it complicated. Now before we get into calculus, let's take a step back to compound interest. Trust me, this is necessary. For now, let's ignore the principle and just set it to 1, and set the rate to 100% per annum. The rate is pretty unrealistic, but bear with me. If we compound it annually, then the result is 2. Compound it half annually, and the result is 2.25. Compound it quarter yearly, compound it eight times, compound it, I don't know, a hundred times, a thousand times maybe, a million times. We can see that the change slows down as you get to arbitrarily large values. If we were to compound a theoretical infinite amount of times, it would converge. We can take a limit as x approaches infinity, and the thing that it equals is defined as Euler's number. But here's the weird thing, it has multiple ways to be defined. If we were to add every reciprocal of a factorial from 0 to infinity, this also converges to Euler's number. So while pi is recurring in geometry, Euler's number is recurring in numeracy. Now, before we get into applications of Euler's number, we should actually see what it equals. It starts with 2.71828, and the 1828 repeats, followed by 459045. It's quite funny, as the first couple decimal points trick you into thinking it's rational before going on forever. The number itself is named after Leonard Euler, a Swiss mathematician. But the E is not for Euler, it's for exponential. Why? Well, it's because Euler's number is employed in a function called the exponential function. Essentially, the function of x is e to the x. Occasionally, it's also notated with exp. After last episode's video, you might be wondering what's the derivative of e to the x. We can't use the power rule because x is the exponent rather than the base, so what do we do? What if I propose a crazy idea? e to the x might be its own derivative. Okay, he hear me out, hear me out. If we observe a graph of e to the x, it makes sense. I mean, as we move across the graph, it starts out slow, then gets fast rapidly. So with a derivative of e to the x, it seems correct. Once again, another recurrence of Euler's number, this time in differential calculus. So can we generalize this? Can we turn this e to the x into a derivative rule rather than a specific case? Well, it looks like this. a to the x has a derivative of a to the x multiplied by the ln of a. So what is this ln a that we're multiplying by? Well, it's a fancy notation for a logarithm of base e, often read as a natural logarithm. So we say that this is the natural logarithm of a. So let's read that again. a to the x has a derivative of a to the x multiplied by the natural logarithm of a. Okay, recap time. We went through the several ways of evaluating Euler's number, its strange property in the exponential function, and even examined further derivative rules employing it. Now it's very important that you get used to the idea of Euler's number, as it recurs in even more areas, such as the complex plane or other derivative rules. After all that, I think we've learned a valuable lesson. On the 14th of March, you can eat your pie, but on the 7th of February, let's remember the truly superior constant.